Well, welcome everyone uh, to the uh, first talk on Monday of the Almost Heaven Star Party 2019. I'm Alan Goldberg. I'm Vice President of NOVAC. And uh, I've taken the slot on Monday morning when hopefully people were up late last night or early this morning because it was clear and got some photons. And Monday morning talk is a, is a fairly bad slot to be in. So I decided to do a, a simple presentation uh, at the beginning level for people to talk about some of the basics. One of the things Novak has tried to do this year is have some talks during our meetings and at Almost Heaven Star Party that are at a very basic level for beginners. And some, some of you will not learn anything from it because you know all this and some of you know this better than I do. Uh, this is not actually my area of specialization either observationally or, or scientifically in uh, in astronomy. But what I'm going to do is talk about the kinds of astronomical objects which are possible to actually observe from a place like Spruce Knob. Not the whiz-bang objects that Hubble can photograph amazingly well and not the topics that are profound in, in current cosmology and are theoretical and only barely observed. But the kinds of things which you can really see through a telescope, a small telescope, or binoculars in the night sky this time of year in particular. Uh, now, of course, we only have one night left, and uh, hopefully it'll be pretty clear, and maybe you can try some of these, uh, but maybe some of them you've seen earlier in the, in the weekend. Uh, and the reason I'm going over that, this is because we, um, we talk about looking at globulars, look at this, looking at this open cluster, looking at this planetary, and I don't think everybody always knows exactly what we mean by these objects or how they differ from each other. Of course, for observational astronomy, the main thing is just to look at things that are pleasing. And you don't have to really understand what it is, but it might be useful to understand a little bit about what these objects are, how they fit into the, into the cosmic structure, and to some extent, if they have had meaning for astronomy and the evolution of the science, give you an idea of what that might be. So I'm going to start with stars. Um, we take them for granted. Uh, from my point of view, the only thing that's really interested in, in, interesting in observing stars individually is their colors. And that's actually very profound and a large part of the history of astrophysics was looking at star colors. But it is something we can see uh, with a small telescope at Spruce Knob. Um, the, uh, when, you look, when you look with Hubble, you just keep on seeing stars after stars after stars after stars. They have been cataloged in some sense, basically because they've been photographed and the photographs have been digitized and uh, they're characterized. In some cases, people scan through and they look for stars of interesting colors. And if they are interesting colors, they look at them in more detail with the spectroscope and they understand uh, a little bit more about them, but most stars are boring. Uh, actually, luckily, our sun is a very mediocre star. It's a G3 type star dwarf, which is very common in the universe, in the, in the Milky Way. Um, there are hotter stars, there are cooler stars, there are bigger stars, there are smaller stars. But the thing which is interesting for observing is you can see their colors. And the prime example, which is up in the fall and visible from the Northern Hemisphere, is Albireo. Uh, and this is a photograph, and I think the colors were probably stretched, but it's a pair, relatively bright, orange star and a dimmer blue star. Now, there's a, a relationship between star colors and temperatures. And it's the common sense, when people talk about blue hot, they mean very, very hot. When they talk about red hot, it's cooler. When you turn on your electric stove, if it gets hot, it's red. And that's the first color that's visible by thermal emission. If you could turn up the stove more and more and more, it would look white and then eventually it would look blue. Uh, and um, this is a diagram called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It's got a lot of embellishments on it, but people realized more than 100 years ago that, uh, not quantitatively a hundred years, well, yes, a hundred years ago, 
that if you estimated the colors of a star and quantified that uh, as temperature and, convert and compared that with the brightness of a star, they didn't scatter all over the place. They fell primarily on a diagonal line that hotter stars tended to be intrinsically brighter and cooler stars tended to be intrinsically fainter. And when I say intrinsically, if you took them to the same distance, it'd be comparable. Uh, and that's became called the main sequence. And then there are others which are bright and cool, and there are a few which are hot and dim, and those are other groups on here. But the point is that when you start getting quantitative about the colors and quantitative about the brightnesses, you find some structure in in the nature of stars in the galaxy. Later on, when they combined this with the physics of how the power was produced, they realized that this represented an evolutionary sequence. And we'll come back to diagrams like this later on in other contexts. But the point here is that the color is something that can be important in the nature of a star, and it's something you can see. Now, I don't think anybody goes out and thinks they're going to help professional astronomers by observing star colors anymore through telescopes, but it's fun. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is we talk about red stars and blue stars, but we never talk about green stars. Uh, and does anybody have an idea why that might be? Sure. Because our eyes and brains are adapted to perceive that middle of the range is white, even though it's actually, the spectrum is actually brown in the, in the green part. That's just the way we're adapted. Well, I think that's because partially true. <laughs> but, it, but it's also because you can't get green from a thermal emitter without also having red and blue coming out. So it turns out you can have blue and not much green and not much red when it's very hot. And that's shown here. Uh, this being the distribution from a heat source across the spectrum. And if it's very cool, you can have red without much green and without much blue, and that's a cool source. But if you have uh, a temperature in the middle that's having mostly <coughs> green, you also are getting red and blue. So it fills it. And there are other diagrams that show how this goes across. You can draw a triangle of the color space of uh, red in one corner, green in a corner, blue in another corner. And it turns out the stars go through a line through the middle and they never go up to green. Uh, and a few years ago, someone in citizen science was looking through just masses of pictures to help a scientific project. I don't remember, but it was uh, a citizen science project. And they did notice a green object, which was extremely unusual. And it's because it was a gas cloud that happened to emit. It wasn't a thermal emission, but you can't get it <coughs> by thermal emission. And, and as you point out, yes, our eyes are, ad are adapted to a G3 star, I which people ask, notice that on that, on that spectrum, the green appears to be stronger than the red and the blue. So they ask, why don't we see that as pale green? And my answer is, the red and the blue are enough to neutralize it, just because of the way our receptors are designed. Yeah. Well, um, and the one other thing I did want to mention. Sometimes you hear about when I said our sun is a G3, <coughs> there's a, uh, a, a sequence of letters that were used to classify these. These letters came from the spectra, <coughs> not really from the color indices, and they indicated features that showed up as the star temperatures changed. Different elements showed up in the spectrum of the stars. The details don't really matter, but because of the, de of the kind of details that showed up, they named the spectral types and it turns out that can be laid out. And at one time, they was sort of an order, but they realized they got it wrong, and when they quantified it, it came out um, OBAFGKM. And there's some others out here that are classified RN and S. Doesn't really matter. But you will run into OBAFK, OBAFGKM as designations for stars. You don't have to remember what it is, but just uh, think of it as being associated with the color temperature how red it is or how blue. 
So anybody else have questions about observing plain old fashioned stars? Is Alberio actually the cooler star? I mean the blue well, it's it's Alberio A and B, okay, yeah. and it's not they're not orbiting. They're actually just two stars that happen to be in the same direction. So there is a difference between, and we'll talk about some others that orbit, but um, early on people couldn't tell. It wasn't until you started measuring the distance because of motions, either across the field of view or along the line of sight, that they could tell that these were different distances. And the whole business of how you measure star distances is a, is a separate one. It's not a direct observational thing. It's something you do with professional equipment. Um, but that's what's called an apparent binary, not a physical binary. So when you start getting to pairs of stars, uh, you end up with two, well, and I shouldn't have jumped in and called this variable first, but stars do orbit around each other. As a matter of fact, most stars now are believed to have companions. So um, they go in orbits. And in a particular, if the orbit is in the plane of the galaxy, uh, in the plane of viewing, you'll just see them as two stars close together. And there are famous pairs, uh, one that's not really easily observable, Sirius has a companion. Uh, Alcor and Mizar in, uh, in the Big Dipper is a binary. And it's usually very distant, where they're physically very far apart if you can split them with a telescope, with a, with a small telescope. But the interesting case call, uh, comes about when they're orbiting like this and one goes in front of the other. And then you get an eclipsing variable. And at first they didn't quite know, it took some analysis to figure out why these stars were changing brightness with a, a, a rapid period, it can be a rapid period, and in a funny way. There'd just be a dip and then things would go on, and a little dip and then go on and a big dip. The most famous eclipsing variable is uh, Algol, Beta Persei, which is up now. Uh, and this is what the light curve looks like. Don't hit the wrong button. The stars are going around like this, and nearly flat to us. And there's a dimmer star and a brighter star. And when the dim star goes behind the bright one, you get a little dip because you're not losing much light. When the dim star goes in front of the bright star, you get a big dip because you're losing most of the light from behind it. And very recently, people have actually taken a photograph with interferometry. This is not a direct photograph. This is a, a um, synthesized photograph, which is why they're globby. Each one of these would really be a point. But this is a true representation of the data of the dim star going around the bright star. That's behind, and this is in front. They didn't quite get it directly in front. The period of the, of the faint star around the bright one is just a little bit less than three days. So it's something which amateurs can conveniently observe because you can go out over a period of clear nights and see the entire cycle. And it's also well predicted. And I looked up to see whether there would be a deep, uh, a deep uh, eclipse during this weekend, and there was, but it was at 9.30, yes, 9.30 yesterday morning, uh, which doesn't help, <laughs> even if we're clear. Um, and it just turns out this, because it's just a little bit less than three days, if it's during the daytime one eclipse, it's probably during the daytime the next eclipse and so forth. So we didn't have a chance this time uh, of seeing it. but. Uh, it's very well known pattern. It is uh, very well predicted. You can look it up online if you're interested. It's uh, an obvious change in brightness. It's going from 2.1 down to 3.4. So it's a big change in brightness. There are a couple stars nearby. And of course, the last uh, NOVAC meeting, we had a visitor from AAVSO, American Association of Variable Star Observers. And that's something which I don't think NOVAC me members have done a lot of, but it's something they could do easily. Now, of course, the frustration with cloudy nights is, okay, you get one of these big dips, and yeah, I've seen it, 
and now I want to see the next one to prove that it's really 2.867328 days and it's cloudy. So really what you have to do is you have to prepare to observe over a long period of time, plot your observations, and fit the data. Look for that pattern in there. You'll see it at 2.86, you'll see it at 5.72, and on and on and on. And if you're good, you'll see the minor dip also. And uh, yeah, it's something amateurs could do. We could have done it here if it had been slightly different conditions. Maybe pay more attention for next year. How would an amateur estimate the variance? That's quite a bit still. Yeah, well, um, this is, uh, it doesn't show up too well. This is at the bright phase, this is at the dim phase. What you do is you compare it to neighborhood stars, which are not variables. And actually, you can get online guides that show known non variable stars. But this one is so much of a change, even if these were slightly variable, it wouldn't matter much. The biggest problem with a star like this, it's brighter than all its neighbors. You might think that looking at a bright variable star is easier than dimmer ones, but actually it may not be, because if it's a dim variable star, you have neighbors that are just about the same brightness. And you can see, well, it's, it's, it's like my bright neighbor now, it's like my dim neighbor now, and people have cataloged the brightnesses of all these neighbor stars such that you can do a visual comparison. It's also something you get experience. But you do it differentially. Nobody's expecting you to look through the eyepiece and say, oh, that's third magnitude. But you can compare it and say, it's like my neighbor. And you make a sketch of what you're seeing and use that to remind yourself what you saw three days ago, six days ago, 12 days ago. Uh, and, and I'm saying this as someone who's never observed a variable star, but always wanted to. Um, but I've always been a city kid and I've never, I mean, it also has to be a high enough above the horizon when it happens. And there, are, there are things like that. But it's also in Perseus, so it's, it's fairly, it's up for a long period during the year. You have many chances to see it. Of course, there are many more variables. This is bright, it's a major uh, dimming at the uh, at the time of eclipse um, so it's an easy one if you have a little bit of uh, perseverance uh, I don't I don't know um, wh wh whatever the separation is that corresponds to an orbit of 2.86 <laughs> yeah but um, this was done interferometrically oops Yeah, this was done interferometrically, so they're damn close. Yeah, I, I don't think they're, uh, they're not optically resolved. Uh, it, it, this, this was, this, the geometry here was inferred, of course. And with the, you know, and when you have a, when you have a binary star, you, you can calculate the masses. So it becomes interesting to study intrinsically because once I know the masses of these stars, then they become more interesting for that spectroscopic analysis and the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Okay, but then we have the stars which are intrinsically variable, not two stars which are intrinsically stable that just happen to block each other, but stars which are unstable in their brightness. And um, one of the most famous classic is Delta Cepheus, it was very important in astrophysics. Uh, again, it's a fairly bright star. It goes between 3.5 and 4.4, so it's a full, an, full magnitude, al almost a full magnitude, and uh, a, a fairly easily visible range. And it also has a very short period, about five and a third days. I didn't check if that was uh, dimming uh, this weekend. Uh, and it has a very different kind of light curve, which of course was a key early on when people studying variable stars that this is different kinds of stuff going on. It, it has a relatively rapid brightening and a slow decrease and a rapid brightening. And this is due to the intrinsic changes in brightness of the star because it's become unstable. It, it has reached a, uh, a stage in its evolution 
These are large stars, massive stars, that go through different stages of nuclear burning. And as they get larger, they get larger and cooler, and then they can't support that expansion, and they collapse, and a different kind of thermonuclear burning occurs, which makes them hotter, and then they start expanding again. So it's a, it's a bounce mechanism going between two different stages and because of two stages, it's called an instability. And the important astrophysical attribute, aside from the intrinsic information it gives us about how the star works, is that it became known through the studies uh, at uh, Harvard Observatory that the period of a star of this class depends on its intrinsic brightness. The brighter it is, the the uh, longer the period. If it's a, if it's a low mass star, low intrinsic brightness, relatively low intrinsic brightness, it it oscillates with a one day period. So th when they talk about phase here, this is saying from whatever the start time is to the next start time of the oscillation. This is the shape, but this is not a fixed time interval. It depends on how big the star is. And for relatively small, low brightness stars, it's about one day. This is the ratio to the brightness of the sun. For, for very bright stars, big stars, it takes five days. And if it's bigger than that, it blows up. But that's, that's coming. So um, there's a range of, of masses and brightnesses of these stars which can cause oscillation. But the amazing value of that is if I see that it's a star that has a shape like this and I measure the time, I know how bright that star is where at its location. And if I know how bright it appears to be and I know how bright it really is, I can tell how far away it is with the inverse square law. And Edwin Hubble's discovery of a star of this type in Andromeda is the evidence that proved that the Andromeda Nebula was outside of our galaxy. Because it had the shape, but it appeared very, very, very faint, and which meant it was very, very far away, which meant that the galaxy it was in, Andromeda, was very far away. Before that, explicit tests, there were two theories. One was they were far away and bright. The other is they were close in inside our galaxy and faint. But they hadn't really resolved them. But he was able to resolve a star with this period, with this pattern, and prove that it's very distant. And it's called generally, it's one of several things in, in astronomy which is called a standard candle. It's something whose brightness I know and therefore uh, if I measure how bright it appears to be, I can tell how far away it is. And I've, I've given a talk before at NOVAC about, um, about the various standard candles which were used and, and how that was important for uh, uh, an important mission of the Hubble Space Telescope because the way that this curve was generated depended on knowing the capital L means the, the intrinsic brightness, how bright the thing really is compared to the sun, not how bright it appears to be. Well, I can't calculate how bright a star really is until I know how far away it really is. And I estimate how far away it really is by measuring it trigonometrically, a thing called parallax. I look at the star from one side of the Earth's orbit, and then I go 186 million miles away to the other side of the orbit, and I look where the star appears to be, and I calculate the angle, and I measure how far away it is. So I can't make this line, I can't get this scale, until I've physically measured the distance to some Cepheid variables. That gives me this scale. This I get off the clock. That's easy. Th then I get this line, then I use this line to tell me how far away a galaxy is if I find another star like that. 
So it's a bootstrapping process of standard candles. And the Cepheids were the hard part, a way to figure out how far away the galaxies were, because the galaxies are too far away to measure with trigonometry. Uh, I move 186 miles, 186 million miles from one side of my orbit to the other, and M31 appears exactly in the same place. Now, that was an indication that it was far away anyway, but there are a lot of things even in our galaxy that are so far away we can't measure by parallax. So Cepheids are important, and they're, they're observable. And uh, I, I should have been a little bit clearer. When I say Cepheids, th this is the namesake for a class of objects. There's nothing special about del Delta Cepheids, except it was one of the first ones identified as having this characteristic. Actually, another one was discovered a couple of weeks earlier, but nobody noticed. Um, so it was named after Delta Cepheus. Um, and this happens also like in the, uh, in the Algol variables is a name for eclipsing variables just because it was the most obvious one. But there's nothing particularly special about Algol as an eclipsing variable. There's nothing special about Delta Cepheus as a Cepheid. It's just the namesake. Okay. All right. Now, stars go on further in their lifetime, and many of them blow up. And when I was preparing what I was going to talk about this morning, I was joking. I was only partially joking to somebody. It was, it was between talking about the cosmic zoo and talking about the Arkofsky effect on small particles spiraling into the sun. And my wife said, which one has better pictures? And <laughs> this, this one has better pictures. So um, <laughs> you'll get Yarkovsky some other year. Um, and, and this is just a selection from Hubble of, uh, of, of planetaries. Stars of a certain size, when they reach a certain age, become totally unstable. They don't oscillate. They blow up. And they don't necessarily totally blow up, but they throw off a, 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 a shell of gas. And there's no single rule about how this happens. And these pictures are sort of violating my rule about what things look like with small telescopes. You're not going to see this with a small telescope. First of all, these things are all faint enough that you're not going to see color. You're, they're all going to be black and white. Your, your eye doesn't have s enough sensitivity to color. And some some planetary can see color. Well, but I say my eyes, my eyes don't see color in any of them. Uh, uh, and and uh, well, yeah, I said moderate size. I mean, yeah, you go through a big dob. You go to a big dob, and, and life gets interesting. I've, I've seen the Ring, Neb the Ring Nebula through the 60-inch at Mount Wilson. And yeah, it has. Actually, it was too big. <laughs> when you get to a 60-inch and you put a reasonable eyepiece in it, I it's big. Um, but yeah, you see color. But um, yeah, this, this is uh, eye candy. But different geometries, because there's no single rule about how shells explode. Generally, they're spherical. Some are very spherical. Something like this is sort of blowing out a cone one sort of towards you, one sort of away from you, uh, a, a smoke ring coming off. Um, but one way or another, and, and there are magnetic effects that control how these things come off, but they're pretty, they're sort of symmetric around the central star. Sometimes you will see the central star, sometimes you won't see the central star. Uh, to some extent, it depends how much of the star blew off in that instability because there are different kinds of instabilities. But it's something which is, a, and, and the ring in Lyra is obviously straight up in the evening this time of year, easy to find near Vega, good target for binoculars. You don't see a lot of detail, but you can see sort of the ring shape. If you get to a larger telescope, you, know, you see a nice ring. And it's a very pleasing thing to see. Uh, again, the impact on astrophysics was you measure the Doppler shift, you see that these things are coming towards you and away from you, and they realized that they were expanding rings. Uh, I was looking for a time series. Hubble has actually done some time series, but the one which is most famous, which is V838 and Monocerotis, uh, which is, I think, southern. Um, over the period of Hubble, they've taken a series of pictures, and you can actually see the thing expand. But then when I looked more carefully, it's not a planetary nebula. It sort of looks like one, but it's another thing called a light echo. 
these planetary nebulae are expanding clouds of material. So they're expanding in some sense subsonically in a cosmic sense. It's, mo it's material moving out at a finite speed. Or just stay here. V minus Herodis is a light echo. It is a pulse came out of a star and that pulse of light has a limited thickness and it's moving out at the speed of light from the star and it's reflecting off of dust around the star and that's called a light echo it's different it doesn't look that different but when you measure the Doppler shift you see it's coming at you at the speed of light not at the speed of matter uh, and you can't see those with telescopes so I, I didn't have the picture I, yes Um, because it, it, it's sort I think it's because they may have thought it was sort of an orbital, uh, a planetary orbit. They knew it wasn't cellular. Uh, <coughs> they knew it wasn't a galaxy. Uh, they, at that point, only saw planets like Saturn as something with ears. Uh, so you know, yeah. they, they really hadn't categorized it. Later on, they realized that it's got nothing to do with Nothing to, nothing to do with oh nothing to do with planets at all okay. and and etym etymologically etymologically it's a bad name for it because planet my understanding comes from wanderer it a planet name refers to the fact that it moves across the sky and these do not move across the sky so it's a bad name in in many senses yes Yes? Uh, one of the things that I read is that back in the 17th and 18th centuries when the telescopes were not particularly good, they could see planets, they could see stars, and they could see these fuzzy things that were nebulous. But the planetaries were a little bit crisper and rounder and they looked more like planets, mm -hmm. but they were still a little fuzzy, so that's probably. Yeah, I, I, I think that probably makes sense, but again, the fact that they don't move should have clued them that they were a different class of things. They should have come up with a different name, but... Right. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's move on. So, when you get away from, and, and this is sort of, uh, it's a matter of classification, this is not, there's no good order. So I talked about stars, I talked about uh, uh, variable stars which are changing and pairs of stars and end of life death throes of planetaries. Uh, in addition to the stars, you get a lot of gas and dust. We also got missing mass and dark matter. But there's a lot of gas and dust. And some of the gas and dust came from stars that blew up. Some of it is protostar material from which stars will form. And some is just floating around, left over from the creation of, of the Milky Way. Uh, and there are three basic types. There are, star there are gas clouds which are br bright because they reflect light from stars nearby. Uh, there are gas clouds which are bright because they're glowing, because a star nearby has pumped them with energy and they're glowing, basically like a neon tube or a fluorescent tube that you pump energy in as a gas that creates light. And then there are dark gas clouds, dark nebulae. Generally, these are called nebulae, um, which nebula comes, at the root is a cloud. They didn't know what they were. So they sort of look cloud-like, and they called them different kinds of nebulae. Uh, and these are sort of examples. The, the Eta Carina, the Carina Nebula, uh, which is visible in Sagittarius this time of year, is a uh, reflection nebula, I believe. The, um, the swan is um, an emission nebula, primarily in hydrogen gas. It's being stimulated to glow. And here's a dark band through the Milky Way. And there are lots of dark bands, there are lots of examples of it, but this is obviously very prominent. I've got some more pictures. When you look at the Milky Way in the south, 
you're going to see that dark band, the, the Great Rift, it's called, I believe, um, where you've got some enough gas and dust to block light, and there's enough light behind it so that you see the fact that there's gas and dust blocking the light. You can have an is isolated dark cloud that makes a star behind it disappear, and then you don't really notice it. Because all, all that's there is the absence of the star, which you didn't know about anyway. So, <laughs> Now, you look at it in radio or infrared, you'll see the star. That's, that's a separate issue. But we're talking about visible here. So these are, uh, yeah, the swan and the carina. Um, and uh, depending on where they are and what's going on with their dynamics, they may be star creation. Most of them are star creation areas. Of course, the... Um, the, the, the Hubble photograph, Pillars of Creation, is named specifically for that. It's an area of star formation. There are a lot of hot young stars in there that illuminate the gases around it and also stimulate emission. So that's a combination of reflection and emission. And when people talk, and we're going to have a talk this afternoon about narrowband imaging, when they talk about the narrowband imaging, they're looking at specific wavelengths of light which are glowing because there's something nearby that's pumping energy in. There's another source, usually ultraviolet light, in some cases X-ray light. But we can't see the ultraviolet, we can't see the X-ray. We see the effect, which is uh, something like this. Here's another one. This is a picture that was taken a few years ago here, just to prove that you can do this here. But this is not what it looks like in the eyepiece. Um, Sometimes. Oh, uh, Tom Kennedy was quite a good ob observer here. Um, and this is oriented. This is Florida before the hurricane hits. Um, and uh, hydrogen gas cloud. I have, I have no idea how long that exposure was, but he, he was very good at giving a tutorial on how to do drift alignment. He would set up, be ready to do photography and take long, long exposure photography during the weekend. Yeah. Okay, now getting back into sort of the in the creation train from these gas clouds, uh, one of the things that forms out of them is open clusters. These are relatively young, small groups of stars which have recently formed. Uh, the best example I could, I could find would be the Pleiades, but it doesn't pass the test of being visible. Actually, when I got up at 5 o'clock this morning, I did see the Pleiades, so I could have put it in. But, you know, when you see a good picture of the Pleiades, or even when you see it on a good dark night, you can see some nebulosity around those 20 stars, roughly 20 stars in there, which is the gas from which they formed some time ago. And uh, it's tens to hundred stars. Um, this is an example. I, I put some of these in. Here's what it looks like in a good deep sky photograph. Here's what it looks like in a quick and dirty photograph. And this is more like what you're going to see uh, with your eye. Uh, your eye has a problem it doesn't integrate for a long period of time. So mm -hmm. you're getting a snapshot. And, th and this is just something that was posted on the web, so the black and white version. You're not going to see that these are hot blue stars. Uh, they're going to look black and white to you. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good point. Uh, yeah, I, I, I they, they appear close. They are actually far. I mean, like, they're more than the size of the solar system kind of thing. These are not in orbit around each, well, they're collectively in orbit around a common center of gravity, and that's something I've never really understood, what the dynamics are that keep these from coming into each other. But they seem to sort of form with some amount of rotation that keeps them apart. And of course, the next one's going to be globular clusters, which are even more complicated in terms of that dynamics. But astrophysically, what is interesting about uh, these kind of open clusters, since there's good reason to believe they create, they're all formed at roughly the same time, they're all the same age. 
So if you go back again, to, this is another version of the HR diagram with the temperature down here, and, and here are your letters, some of them, uh, for the temperatures. And uh, are those? No, I'm sorry, these are just color indices, but it's the same. Uh, uh, Okay. And and what and Proxima Centauri is like four light years, right? Roughly. Yeah. So they're no closer together than random stars are in our neighborhood. But they're a little bit more concentrated, and we when we look at them from our point of view, they're they're a cluster because they're, they're not only all at the same sort of separation from each other, but they're all same distance. So they're not unreasonably close together. But they are gravitationally bound, they're kind of like family? Well, they're traveling together, and that's one of the things which has never been quite clear, whether they're orbiting the center of the galaxy together, or they're really orbiting each other. I, I, I can't tell you that one. That it must be true, <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, that's your, that's your homework for next year, is okay. to come back and tell us. Also, the best guess is they're slowly moving away. Moving away. So I think, I, I think they're more bound to, this, to the center of the galaxy than they are to each other. But they are, they're genetically, they're, they're siblings. And, and, and that's what I was going to get to, that when you plot them individually on the HR, of temperature, and, and here it's done by color index, not by spectral classification, but that's the same kind of thing, and brightness. Uh, they're also all at the same distance, so you don't have to know the distance to know they're all the same. Um, the relative brightnesses are, are in proportion to the absolute brightnesses, so they're easier to work with. And when they plot the uh, brightness versus color, for each one, you end up with sort of a line, and these this is the main sequence, but the bigger ones have moved off the main sequence in their evolution, and they have gotten brighter, and in some cases cooler, in some cases, uh, they don't get dimmer. As they evolve, they get brighter, but they get different temperatures, and the combination of brightness and temperature tells you, in effect, the diameter, because the hotter it is, the brighter it is per surface area, and then the total brightness depends on the brightness per surface area times the surface area, total surface area. So there's a lot of stuff that can be deduced, but each open cluster is assumed to be, all the stars in the cluster are the same age, but the clusters are all different ages. So by plotting them this way, the, the stellar evolution guys can figure out how things moved from when they were young and a distribution of masses to when they're old and a distribution of masses. And that's always been a hard thing for me to get my head around, but it's, it's similar to the issue of taking, taking a snapshot of multi-generations of a family does not tell you how they got to those ages. It just shows you what they look like now. And your grandfather doesn't look like the baby, did not look like the baby when he was a baby, although the baby is sort of related to him in the family. I'm not sure if that's a good explanation. But a snapshot of, of evolution does not tell you how individuals within that population evolved. It tells you how the assemblage evolved. But when, when you think about this hard, you get to other plots that show how an individual star would evolve as it ages. And they tend to go up this way and then back down to white dwarfs. And that kind of an insight came from characterizing all these open clusters. And as a next step, globular clusters, which have thousands of stars in them, they tend to be old. They tend to be, the, the open clusters are distributed in the plane of the galaxy the globular clusters tend to be more uniformly 
in a halo around the galaxy for reasons I don't understand. I think there are people who, who do understand. They're older. They seem to be have created earlier in the, in the evolution of the galaxy. They're bigger. Uh, and and uh, so there are more dots. And they have different shapes. But we know these are all collections of older stars. Mainly they've moved more up into this red giant branch. You're getting more red giant stars. And there's a whole thing, they talk about population one stars and population two stars, depending on how old they are in the galaxy. Putting it all together with some other things about solar system evolution, people were able to come to the, the fundamental conclusion that we have multi-generational stars. There are very old stars created early in the history of the universe, which are almost entirely hydrogen and helium which is the stuff of the early universe. But those stars, some of those stars have gone completely through their evolutionary period, blown up, and in their evolution created heavier elements. And in their final explosion created heavier elements. And those elements floated around in gas clouds for a while and then recoalesced into other stars. And I don't know what the current theory our star is a second, uh, our sun is a second or third generation. But our star has elements in it which could not have been made, which were not present in the original universe. It has more than just hydrogen and helium. It has stuff in it that must have been created in stars which have blown up before. And similarly, this, the silicon in these rocks, did not exist in the early universe. But it must have been created in the explosion and the, nuclear, uh, and the nucleosynthesis in first generation stars, in stars like these, which have evolved through their lifetime a long time. These are the ones that are still left, but the ones that evolved faster blew up, created things like silicon, and made it available as the sun and the solar system coalesced to permit rocky planets to form. So if I had a star which was actually still around that was made from the primordial goo of 14 billion years ago, it could not have planets. Because there's nothing to make the planets out of. It can only have hydrogen and helium. And therefore there are no planets around it. Now those stars are probably all gone in our neighborhood. But um, that, that, that's, that's one of the more interesting, I think, uh, discoveries from cosmological evolution. And, and it came from things like this and people thinking about it. Somebody um, had a question? You're talking about the globular clusters as having um, a lot of the you know, original elements, so they're probably really all stars. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering why, if anybody knows why they haven't, you know, well, not yet, why they haven't changed and gone through the cycle like a lot of other well, they're old, but not so old that they've totally dissipated. They're old, they're the oldest ones that are still around. The ones that would have gone through the full cycle would have been uh, heavier, bigger stars evolve faster. That's known because, because they, they get to high temperatures for nucleosynthesis faster because the pressures are greater at the centers. So they evolve faster. So those big old stars, and this is a little bit of my extrapolation of the bits and pieces of what I've gotten, those, those went through their lifetime and went. These are the ones that are still around. I, 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 I can't say, these are not prim old primordial. These are maybe first generation okay. stars, and we're second, maybe. Mm -hmm. Lyle? I, I don't I don't know. Yeah, I've um, the whole business of interacting galaxies. I, you know, I know they they do. I I have no idea how frequently they do, 
or what they're hypothesizing about proto galaxies that come together that 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 hurts my head. Right. Right, and my, my, my roommate in grad school was trying to understand halo globulars and, and how the glo halo globulars were different from the plane globulars, yeah. and, and I, I don't understand it. Uh, and, and there's still mystery. There's still mysteries to me, but I, I, I don't go to all the sessions in the AAAS, and that, that would really hurt my head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we've had this discussion. The first thing they tell you is not to say, I don't know. Um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, 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 and related to that, and I don't remember which point it was, but um, I think it's fairly well established that in garden variety stars, you can only get up to a certain point in the table of the elements. I, I, I don't know if you remember what it is. Iron. iron. Yeah, iron. And beyond that, you need a supernova. And there's some problems in there aren't enough supernovas. Where do you get all this? I mean, you know, obviously there's gold on Earth, and gold is not produced in garden variety stars. So where are all the supernovas that created the heavy elements? You know, gold, let alone uranium. That's really hard to make, and that's why I say, well, it's got to be a supernova. Right. Well, yeah, but but yeah, w there aren't enough of those. W where where are all those events happening, such that? And then we get back to this whole to this whole thing, which is called the anthropic principle, that the universe appears to be the way it is from where we are because we're here. That's one way of stating it. And you know, I'm not one who believes that planets are rare, but we still could be anomalous to some extent. Because when we see protoplanets around other things, we can't tell if they have heavy elements. We can tell if their stars, in some cases, we can tell if their stars have heavy, heavy elements because we can look at their spectra and see if there are any heavy elements. But heavy elements are hard to see in stellar spectra because there's so, such a small concentration. And then you get the other thing is how do we get enough material in the protoplanetary disk of heavy elements to make the rocky planets. And I guess the math works out. It doesn't take much, but you still have to get the condensation. All the hydrogen and helium that was out in this vicinity went away, and it left the gold and silicon and, nitri and, and uh, iron and carbon and stuff like that to make the Earth. Because uh, the big things on Earth are hydrogen and water, oxygen in rocks, silicon, Iron, nickel. Those are the big ones, right? That's it. There's but there's what? There's what? And that's one of the things you have to you have to say that there had to be more of it going on before there had to be more of those first generation supernova uh, uh, very massive stars. 
But then you have to have up, you have to come up with a theory of why very massive stars were, were, were produced then and not now, or maybe they're being produced now, we just don't see them. Yes? yes. Was that Michelle Fowler? Finally, that, yeah. That is really worth looking up. If you haven't seen that, that particular period, it works well. Well, she came and spoke at Novak a few months ago. And that's one of the talks where I, I think I leave thinking I understand <laughs> what was said. <laughs> and, and then and I certainly can't explain it, and I'm not sure that, that I really did understand it at the time. But she's a very, a very good speaker. And yes, she did do something like that. And I think that was my last reminder that the heavy elements can't come from anything other than, as far as we know, because <coughs> there are a lot of things that, you know, 50 years ago we thought we knew everything. So, well, except there's this one other thing we don't understand, and that's, all, that's the heart of the problem. All right, let me move on. Actually, I'm getting towards the end. Uh, now how far apart are these stars in the globe? I think it's about the same, but they are self-gravitating. Okay. <coughs> the, these guys are all orbiting around each other. They change, they're zipping around and <coughs> get the whole thing about what the center of our galaxy looks like, which may look like a, a super dense globular. Um, and, and something else that breaks my head, I don't know you ha how you have all these arbitrary orbits and, and how is that stable over a long period of time. Clearly, you can have things orbiting around the common center of gravity, but if there's no traffic cop, you know, in effect, in the galaxy, there's a traffic cop. In, in the solar system, there's this graphic cop. Everybody's going around the same way, but uh, sort of the same way. Mm -hmm. But in globulars, there's no traffic cop. Well, they found uh, in a couple of globulars black holes. Uh, so to add more complexity. Right. Well, <laughs> I, I think the theoreticians, whenever they run into a problem, they invent a black <laughs> hole. <laughs> you know, in mathematics, singularities, and you, you just move them around in a complex plane, and you can solve anything. Um, yes? Go back to the first, the, next, the previous slide. That turn off of the main sequence, the, the, I understand mm -hmm. that varies depending on the globular. Well, depending on the age of the globular. Uh, but, but again, a, an individual star here, this star did not come up this way. This star may have gone here, and the snapshot we take now, this is the locus of where all these stars of the same age and different masses have ended up at this point. So there's a tendency, and, and this was my problem for a long time, and I still have it. This is not the evolutionary track, but basically these low mass objects are evolving slowly, and they started out down here, and they're sort of moving up here slowly. And the ones that started further up moved up and then went over to form this and and others here and then they come back down here and this is the instability gap where you 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 know you live or die quickly and then you get over here and things become stable again the rr lyra stars and the cepheids are in here the instability zone and there may have been, in any given globular, there may have been some self-limiting process that limited the range of masses that were created because of the, somehow the way the, ma the, the gas was distributed up. And then there are other guys who have just zipped around here and they're gone. They're, they're invisible uh, dwarfs. Or they if, they, if they ended up down here, they j ended up getting swallowed up by somebody because they, they whatever the densities or how fast they moved. But the, I, in the books, which I read a long time ago, and I was trying to understand astronomy, it was really confusing in their descriptions that, you know, this, descri they say, this describes the evolution of the, of the globular. Well, not really. This is a snapshot of it now. And if I look at a whole bunch of different globulars, again, which are different ages, 
they'll all have generally the same shape, but they'll differ in detail. And actually, if we go back to, oh yeah, it's just that one. This is getting to that point. This is not the same shape as the other one. And these are relatively young in that nothing has evolved, very little has evolved very far off of the main sequence, the place where you can live for a long time. W and just hydrogen burning. I'm getting the hook. Um, you, you, you live here very quiescently like our sun, burning hydrogen into helium and nothing fancier. Um, and some of these have begun to evolve off. Some of their stars, not them, but some of their stars have evolved off the main sequence. This one being what? I don't know, M41, I guess. Um, has, is probably the oldest one here. That um, it's got a lot of stars which have moved up and around and ended up at different places. And, and it's impressive that the nucleosynthesis guys, the, the people who do Stel uh, stellar interior modeling can put this stuff together. Actually, they did it when they were grad students and then they're resting on the laurels. But um, when they were grad students, they worked hard and figured out what was going on. Okay, let me move ahead. Uh, that's moving backwards. Okay, um, so we moved out to open clusters, globular clusters. The biggest assemblage, obviously, is the Milky Way. Um, and this is, this is not quite what we see. This is a panorama that was done at the European Southern Observatory where they put together the whole thing. And of course, at the Southern Observatory, they get nice views of all this good stuff here, the galactic center. So this, they put the galactic center here and this is 180 degrees in either direction. Um, so this represents from our point of view, looking at the center of the galaxy and we're seeing sort of an indication of the bulge it's, um, it's always been misleading because there's a lot of gas and dust between us and the bulge. So we're seeing the bulge, our side of the bulge. We're not seeing the real bulge. And we're seeing these nice gas clouds, these dark gas clouds, which are between the bands. Uh, and it was sort of interesting as I was looking through for clip art, I found this. William Herschel thought he could figure out what was going on here by counts in various directions. And this is where he thought we were, and this is how many, relatively how many stars he thought in each direction. He apparently assumed that the density was uniform, and therefore the number of stars he saw indicated how big the thing was. The more stars, the further it was. So he, prob he, he thought this was the, the direction to the galactic center. But of course, being a good classical astronomer, we were at the center of the universe, and the question was how were stars distributed around us? And it was an, uh, a, a kind of insight that mainly came from the Dutch 100 years ago, Oort and, and his people who started looking at the motions of these stars, uh, mainly across the field of view, and said, no, everybody's orbiting and the point of that they're orbiting around is here. And this is a modern map from roughly where we are in what it's calling the Orion arm of the pinwheel. Um, and, and it's the Orion arm because if we look towards Orion, we're seeing a bunch of stars that fr are from our neighborhood. And we look to the galactic center and we're looking through all kinds of different arms. But this kind of a map comes mainly from radio and infrared, which can see through the dust. Because among all the stars is dust, which is visually opaque. So we're, we're not seeing all the stars. We're not getting good star counts. Until, uh, actually, the star counts get better when we look away from the disk. When we look up here, we're getting a fair measure of the number of stars, the extent of the galaxy out of the plane. Um, but the point being, you can see this. And this is, you know, you don't even need binoculars. And if you get binoculars, you see all kinds of detail in here. And uh, yeah, so Herschel was doing his stuff 1785. If I go ahead, this is just some eye candy. This is one picture taken by Sean a few years ago from here. Um, and he, he picked up, I guess, a meteor. Uh, 
And I've got one that John took Thursday night, John McDonald, uh, to prove to all you people you should volunteer next year because <laughs> you get to come up on the clear night. Uh, uh, Chris Lee will take your name um, as you leave. Um, and it seems we get, we get more airplanes now than meteors, although we saw some meteors Thursday night too. And um, a little bit of light from Franklin, maybe. Or Harrisonburg, maybe. Um, and I, I don't know, have we ever figured out why it's orange? I mean, everybody's picture showed orange Thursday night. Humidity. humidity, yeah. So we're getting a little bit of white light and just the humidity. We're seeing so far, it's just eventually you're going to run into water vapor, and that knocks it out. And of course, we have some, cla I, I put in John's to replace a classic that we have of uh, lightning down here with the Milky Way above. So this is nice eye candy, and if, if you zoomed in with binoculars, you'd see all kinds of messier objects, planetaries, globulars, um, uh, not so much globulars, open clusters in there. Lots of stuff to just sit out on a lawn chair and, uh, and, and use your binoculars. I advocate, sta I advocate stabilized binoculars. <laughs> um, and, then, and then we get outside of our galaxy. And here's two pictures, here's, here's sort of a a nice observatory picture of M31. I tried to reduce it. This is at the same, roughly the same scale. Here are the two companions. Here are two companions. This is sort of what you might see with a small telescope here. And again, you're going to see pretty much black and white. You you were getting this. Not color, but you yeah you're gonna you're gonna tend to see this this uh, dust dust band. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is clearly and 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 getting back to what I was talking about at the beginning, someplace in here is the Cepheid variable which Hubble detected um, and, and proved that this nebula was um, uh, outside of our Milky Way, <laughs> much further away. And then you can also see here's um, M81 and M82, which are examples. Here's a normal galaxy, here's an abnormal galaxy, the cigar galaxy. Uh, it has an active nucleus, something bad's happening in there. Yeah, you can always go look for supernovae as a, as a hobby. That's uh, <laughs> that'll keep you outside. So I think that's about it that I had. And this is another eye candy. This is our, our classical image of the Milky Way behind our, our tree out there. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions? Yeah, um, back on the nebula, I think it's worth noting the North American Nebula by Tom Kennedy, he took an hour to take that picture and, and the composite. If we go out in our telescope, we're not going to see that. We might not see any nebula without a filter of some kind. My eyes are not good enough through my scope just to pick up nebula. But it's too, too dim. Too dim, yeah. If there are too many other stars, especially out here. You, you might the, the filter. Well, yeah, that's, that's a good point. The emission nebula are putting <coughs> out their light at discrete lines. And if you get a nebular filter, hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen lines, mainly hydrogen, um, you will selectively transmit the light which they're actually emitting, and you'll block everything else. And even, even here, where we've gotten away from the light pollution from cities, there is a natural light pollution. There is sky glow, which is primarily oxygen lines in our atmosphere that have nothing to do with pollution.
but it's a brightness, it's a residual brightness in the sky. And you've also got, you've got the starlight. A nebular filter will filter out the stars that are also illuminating that field, such that you just see the gas. And even though it makes the scene dimmer, the contrast is greater. And people need to understand it's not really brightness to background, it's contrast to background that matters. So even though in the Swan and the North American Nebula, uh, when you put a nebula filter in, they all get dimmer. But the thing you're looking at doesn't get as much dimmer as everything else, such that it, you, you see it more clearly. And of course, if you go to a daub, you, you get brighter again. So that's the that's one good yeah. reason to have a light bucket. So, uh, not so much here as uh, other sites, but to more commonly add, uh, when you're using those filters, a uh, good thing to, to do is to shield the light around uh, coming in from the side of the eyepiece, whether a uh, black cloth or a towel or right. something like that, because your eye can make better use of the contrast then, because you're, you're not uh, light adapting to the light pollution coming in from the side. So, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. This particular object. Yeah, that's a good point. If if all you saw was this, you wouldn't think you were seeing anything. Well, I saw it Thursday night, and you're right. I did just see that sort of like that and I had to use it on the nebula filter, too. But usually, meant that those three filters on planet Earth, the planet of that nebula is mostly only emitting those three or three invisible ranges that you're around. You're going to get most of it all, and you'll feel the starlight around. Okay. Well, I think it, with that, we need to take at least a little break. We have another speaker at 11, and I've lost track of the schedule, who it is. Is it... Um, Actually, our next, our next speaker is Bob Cobb. Oh, we don't have a second one this morning. Yeah. Ah, okay. So I basically was concerned in case anybody had something else that I personally could listen to you for the rest of the day. <laughs> okay. Okay, so... Thank you.